Hi, I'm Rosanna Cruz. Uh, I also go by RC. Um, and I am the founder of Racial Justice Reads. Today is the final installment of this uh, special series, Racial Justice Reads Live, that we've done, you know, this COVID-19 summer. Um, and we're uh, really excited to close out um, with the genre memoir. Um, we have some really amazing authors that are joining us for this today. And um, I'm really excited. Uh, the registration numbers have been beautiful. We have folks joining us via Zoom. We're uh, broadcasting this on Facebook Live. And um, it's just really powerful to see this community grow in such a short period of time. So I wanna just start by um, thanking our host organization, Race Forward, um, and uh, giving a little bit of background about how Racial Justice Reads was formed. Um, we founded Racial Justice Reads as a book fair initially at Facing Race, which is uh, Race Forward's biannual conference that brings together thousands of uh, racial justice organizers, um, authors, artists, um, culture makers, uh, folks in policy, folks in government, um, folks in community, uh, just a wide range of folks who are invested in racial justice. And it's been going on since 2007. And so in 2018, I was like, you know what's missing is we really need to like make a space for books and the ways in which books are um, doing their own work in this movement and in the public conversation around race and racial justice and, and the questions about um, you know, representation and what it means for us to be able to see ourselves um, in different genres, right? And there's, you know, a lot of really great books out there that are your kind of, you know, in this moment, I know they're the, the books that are selling out right now, you know, that folks go to um, as the race books, but there's a lot of really important conversations and a, a lot of really important stories that come in other genres, what we're calling innovative genres when it comes to racial justice. So um, the genres that we highlighted uh, in this series, Racial Justice Reads Live, we started with young adult fiction. Um, and then last week we uh, brought together uh, speculative fiction authors and Today we're uh, doing memoir, which has been a really powerful genre um, and that we're really excited to get into this conversation. So that's the background on Racial Justice Reads. Um, our authors, uh, Meredith Toulousen, Jakira Diaz, and Kiese Lehman are three powerhouses. People who, I mean, I feel like y'all like have been gracious to agree to do the, the memoir um, conversation and also our Swiss army knives when it comes to being writers, right? Like you're doing so many things. Meredith has worked in publishing, Jakira is doing fiction, Kiese is out here, you know, um, fighting institutions with his words, um, you know, pulling together literary quilts. And so um, I just wanna acknowledge that as we come into the conversation um, and really like just thank you for um, making the space to focus specifically on memoir and the power of memoir in advancing racial justice. So thanks. Hi. Hey. Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> and can everybody, I'm, I'm looking in the chat now, can everybody see everybody? I it's like the big reveal. <laughs> Wonderful, thanks. So just wanted to um, say hi and how are y'all doing? Um, before we get into the, the program, we're gonna start with um, having each of you read an excerpt from your book, um, from your memoir specifically. Um, so far, each of you only have one, right? So it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so that folks get introduced for those of you um, attendees who aren't familiar with all three books, um, especially Meredith's just came out this month, right? Yep. Um, we want to make sure that folks get a taste of um, the text that we're going to be talking about. And so just wanted to go ahead and say welcome 
I don't know if y'all want to shout out the folks in, um, in the room with us. Say hi, and then we'll um, get into the readings. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm just looking at this at this long list of folks. Um, it's it's super wonderful to see so many people um, joining us. Well, um, wanted to go ahead and start with the readings. Meredith, will you kick us off, please? Um, sure. Uh, my memoir is called Fairest. I have the book here, um, and. Um, for people who are not familiar with my work, I am um, a Filipina immigrant who is albino. Um, and so my book, and, and then eventually um, I was assigned male at birth and I transitioned um, and now I'm now a woman. Um, and so the, my book chronicles that journey from the Philippines to the States from um, you know, from a childhood being raised as a boy to um, a womanhood as an adult. And, um, and so I decided to read from the first chapter of the book. And because I'm albino, I'm, I have vision problems. So I'm reading from an iPad. Um, and um, this is, these are the very first, um, there's a prologue before this, but um, this is from the very beginning of the book, from the first chapter. Among my people, it is a widely held belief that an infant would become whatever its mother had craved. Sugar and a child would turn out sweet, for instance, or plantains and the baby would grow sturdy. Pregnant women were therefore advised not to spend too much time in the sun and certainly not to stare at it directly for fear that their baby would be born a nakaro, a sun child, the strangest creature whose skin was so pale it glowed and who couldn't open its eyes except to squint destined to be nearly blind, an affront against nature. Yet on the long bus ride from my parents' house in Manila to my hometown of Telaxan in the province of Bulacan, my grandmother, Nanay Koro, told me that as soon as she held me in her arms, she was sure I was a blessing. She refused to allow anyone to talk about me any other way, especially because I was destined to live in America, the richest of countries where Mama's father, Lola Burt, had settled, full of people who looked like me. And anyway, I wasn't like other in Akara. My mother stayed away from the son when she was pregnant, but craved sweet corn. And so, and so that was how I must have ended up with corn silk hair and fair skin. Though I did burn in the sun, I wasn't near blind like I was supposed to be, only nearsighted, which was lucky since I wouldn't have known what to do with myself if I couldn't read. As our bus sped across the highway through an endless series of rice paddies, which I perceived as patches of yellowish brown, since it was April and the fields had been harvested, my grandmother assured me that I was meant for a better future than her and our ancestors, farmers who had tilled soil in the fields surrounding our village for generations. This is because you are fair and beautiful, my grandmother said, not dark and ugly like me. Wow. One of the lessons that I've learned in doing these is just to give folks a second, right, to digest it. Um, so thank you for that excerpt. And um, Jakira, when you're ready, if you'll uh, go next, that would be great. Thank you. That's, that's hard to follow. Thank you for that, Meredith. I'm going to be reading from um, a chapter in Ordinary, Ordinary Girls called Home is a Place. And if you, have, if you happen to have the book with you, it starts on page 49 in the hardcover. Our white grandmother, Mercy, hated that my hair was a tangle of dry, frizzy curls like my father's. Bad hair, she called it. The summer I turned six, Mercy had decided I needed a haircut so that I'd look like a decent young lady and not a street urchin. Look at you, she said. You look like you belong to a clan of bandoleros. And she knew hair because she'd gone to cosmetology school. She'd also gone to school to become a phlebotomist and EKG technician. 
Mercy collected certifications, but never had a job. She collected other things too, unemployment, food stamps, disability, welfare, social security, settlements from multiple slip and fall lawsuits. She collected eviction notices, moving 12 times in 10 years. She collected husbands and daughters, seven daughters and twice as many husbands. And when the husbands all left, she sent the daughters away to be raised by a sister in Patagonia and aunt in El Caserio. The day before my sixth birthday, Mercy sat me down in my mother's kitchen and spread her beauty supplies on the table, combs and hair clips and scissors and hand mirrors and a hair pick. She draped a towel over my shoulders the way I'd seen stylists do to mommy. Mercy spritzed my hair with water and went to work with a fine tooth comb. I flinched each time she yanked my hair, cried out as the comb got tangled in it. She smacked the top of my head with the comb, told me to stop flinching. It wasn't her fault. I took after my father. Mercy never wasted a chance to complain about those people. Her worst nightmare, she'd say, had been that her white daughters would end up marrying Negros. So of course, what had my mother done first chance she got? She married my father, un negro. Mercy started cutting back to front. The strands tickled my neck as they fell. She talked and snipped, and I sat quietly so I wouldn't get whacked again. Your brother got lucky, she said. He turned out like me. But no matter how much Anthony looked like Mercy, he was nothing like her. My brother adored Abuela, could not stand Mercy, refused to be around her, even if she was mommy's mother. After she finished combing and cutting, Mercy pulled the towel from my shoulders with a dramatic swoop and announced that she was done. I looked down at all the brown hair at my feet. She took my chin in her hand, lifted my face, and got a good look at me. Then she handed me the mirror. My hair was gone. She cut off all my curls, leaving me with a close cropped afro like my father's. I ran a hand over my head, shocked. I was hideous. It wasn't the haircut, she said, chuckling. It was my bad hair. It would be that way my entire childhood. Your father's fault. Your father and his black family. Your black grandmother. Your black uncle. I would never look like my mother or like Mercy, and she would never let me forget it. Thank you. Thanks, Shakira. That's a story that needs to be told over and over again in our community. So I just want to give another second there. And thanks again for sharing that. And passing it to Kiese. Uh, damn, I sure don't want to read after, after those two. <laughs> Y'all are a whole gang of killers, OK? Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, I'm just going to read a, a short passage um, from um, when I'm 17 years old, and it's the night of the uh, Rodney King verdict. The next day on April 29th, 1992, the night of the Rodney King verdict, you held me in your lap and would not stop rocking for two straight hours. We watched L.A. burn as camera showed a white man pulled from a truck getting beat up by a black and brown man at an L.A. intersection. I hope you see what they aren't showing, you said. I want you to write an essay about what white folks feel tonight. I know they're blaming us. I looked at you like your bread wasn't done because the last thing I cared about was what white folks felt. I'd only been alive, I'd only been alive for 17 years and I was already tired of paying for white folks' feelings with a generic smile and a manufactured excellence they could not give one fuck about. I never heard a white folk getting caught and paying for anything they did to us or stole from us. It didn't matter if it was white police, white teachers, white students, or white randoms. I didn't want to teach white folks not to steal. I didn't want to teach white folks to treat us respectfully. I wanted to fairly fight white folk and I wanted to knock them out. Even more than knocking them out, I wanted to never ever lose to them again. I knew there was no way not to lose unless we took back every bit of what we'd been stolen from us. I wanted all the money, the safety, the education, the land, the healthy choices, and the second chances. 
if we were to ever to get back what we were owed, I knew we had to take it all back without getting caught though, because no creation on earth was as all world at white folk at punishing the black hole for the supposed transgressions of one black individual. White folk were absolute geniuses at inventing new ways for masses of black folk with less to suffer more. Our superpower, I was told since I was a child, was perseverance, the ability to survive no matter how much they took from us. I never understood how surviving was our collective superpower when white folk made sure so many of us did not survive. And those of us who did survive seemed to practice bending so much that breaking seemed inevitable. That night when you finally started snoring, I crept into the kitchen and opened the garage. I got in your Oldsmobile, put it in neutral, pushed it out in the driveway. I didn't go far, just a mile down the road to the grocery store. I waited in the parking lot for the bread truck to pull up. When the driver went in the store, I got out of the car, snatched as many loaves of wheat bread, white bread, hamburger buns, and cinnamon rolls as I could and took off back to my car. I sped away from the grocery store and drove to a parking lot overlooking the Ross Barnett Reservoir. I ate cinnamon rolls, hamburger buns, and white bread that night until I got the shivers and threw up. The next morning, I served you some buttered wheat toast for breakfast in bed. You hugged my neck and told me thank you. You told me that we would win this fight, but you never asked me where the bread came from. Yeah, beautiful. Heartbreaking also. It's shocking to me to think about how many people are alive now that were not alive then. I know that's like a weird thing, but like that was such a defining moment for so many of us or like, you know, in a stack of defining moments in the racial history of this country. So thank you for that, Kiyosei. Whew, yes, a whole gang of killers. Look, um, when we put this panel together, um, I knew it was gonna, you know, the, the books are hard, are hard reads, beautiful, gripping, challenging, um, and, and for, for, I think for a lot of us, gutting reads. I think, I wanna say, Jakira, um, it was particularly poignant for me to read your book as somebody who walked those same streets in South Beach at the same time, you know, in those same years, um, and having, you know, a very different experience. And at the same time, the environment and the, and the, the racial reality of that place, right? Um, Miami being what I think of as such an amnesiac city, right? Like a place that's really about um, looking forward and never looking back, right? And always forgetting its history. Um, it was the first time I'd ever seen like a book document that, that period in that place. So I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the, you know, the, we did barely if any introductions. And, and I think the introductions are always a, like, you know, I, we could read what's written in your bios, but what I really love is the introduction that includes like, who are your people, where are y'all from, right? And so wanted to just invite um, us to get into the, the conversation a little bit about talking about the, like those origin stories, right? Like, who are your people, what's, what's your lineage? And when we talk about that, um, you know, querying it uh, for all of us, to say, as artists, we have a literary lineage, um, as um, people who are, you know, justice loving and seeking, we have a movement lineage. So it's, it doesn't have to be your bloodline, right? In terms of when you answer this question, I want to invite y'all to answer it from whatever lineage feels most, um, most urgent, most present. I guess I can start since you started talking a little bit about um, Miami, but I think the question for me of literary lineage is really difficult because, I mean, I didn't find a book written by a black Puerto Rican um, published in America until mm. this one recently. 
This is um, Dalma Llanos Figueroa's Daughters of the Stone. And um, I felt like I spent my whole life looking for people like me in books and not finding them. And so I, I found one book, one memoir when I was a teenager, you know, trying to see myself in stories, which was Esmeralda Santiago's when I was Puerto Rican. And then spent years and years waiting for publishing to kind of reflect our stories, to, to publish books about people like us. And I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. So the question of literary lineage for me feels like I had to write that into my book and talk about um, the people who were actually fighting for liberation in Puerto Rico, um, talk about people like Pedro Arbizu Campos and Blanca Canales and Lolita Lebron, because I, I'm still waiting for these books to be published. I'm still waiting for publishing to catch up. Mm -hmm. I feel that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, definitely for me too, in terms of, you know, literary ancestors, I, I feel like for me, it's very much a cobbling together um, of, you know, of all of these different people and inspirations, right? You know, like everybody from, you know, from immigrant writers like Jamaica Kincaid, um, you know, that really comes to mind as an early influence um, to Filipino writers like Jessica Hagedorn um, and Gina Apostol. Um, but I think for me, you know, like when I think about, you know, sort of like my people and my lineage, especially in the context of having listen um, to both Shakira and, um, and KSA read, I couldn't help but get emotional and think about um, my grandmother who actually um, survived a lot of um, torture during the, um, and you know, was an assault survivor, et cetera, et cetera, during World War II in the hands of the Japanese. Um, and I think part of the reason why she became, you know, sort of like really fixated by white America is because she perceived um, white Americans as having saved her, right, from that, um, you know, like from that fate and from that, um, you know, like from a future full of, um, you know, like full of um, hurt and, and pain, right? Um, and yet at the same time, sort of like thinking about how, you know, like how because of the fact that I was so close to her as a kid and my identity was formed through her lens, right? Like, what does that mean um, for me and my future? The other thing that I think a lot about is the fact that um, in Filipino indigenous culture, um, third gender people called babaylan actually occupy really hallowed, really important places, um, were able, you know, had high positions in indigenous society um, and had, um, and were, were allowed to marry just like non, just like cisgender women. Um, and I think about that a lot because I carry a really sort of like strong and fundamental sense um, that, being trans does not make me in any way inferior. Um, and that in fact, um, my experiences have given my life so much texture and, um, and, and I've gained so much insight from being trans. So those are the two things that I think about. Um. Yeah, you know, just, um... Yeah, I'm trying to sit with that. You know, I, I usually identify as like a black Southern writer from Jackson, Mississippi, because that's a big part of who I am. Um, but listening to Meredith, like in my writing, what I want people to understand is that, you know, I'm I'm my grandmama's grandbaby. You know, I'm I'm a first grandbaby. Uh I'm forty five years old and I'm still a grandbaby. And that means everything to me. Um I'm from Mississippi because my grandmother primarily uh, refused to go north with the rest of her family because she thought that the land and the work that she put into that place was, was hers and subsequently ours. Um, so 
I'm I'm a I'm I'm my grandmama's grandbaby and 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 I feel like I belong to her and equally I feel like I belong to Fannie Lou Hamer. I feel like I belong to Richard Wright. I feel like I belong to Marco Walker Alexander. Um and you know I, I love them all enough to try to critique them, but everything I do I wanna you know, not just make them proud, but just make them say, damn, you know? And, and, and that's, I hadn't really thought about it until I heard Mary say that, but that, that's, 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 that's who I am. I, I belong to these folks and, and I just want, I want them to, I want them to feel awe and, 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 and everything I create. Cause, cause that's what I feel and what they've created for, for us, for so many of us. I'm just noticing, I'm like, there is a theme here um, that binds all three of you, I mean, including me too, um, here is this this relationship with our grandmothers, right? Um, and, and I think that's interesting that there's, there is a, a real strong connection to your grandmothers, all three of you, um, and, and just want to kind of give them a moment, right? Like, y'all want to talk about your grandmas? Like, let's talk about them, um, because they, you know, like, they deserve that space, you know, um, if you're feeling it. Can I talk about my Black grandmother since I read this poem? <laughs> well, that's who I was, I, I was actually thinking about your Black grandmother since you <laughs> talk about her in the book so much and she's right. such a abuela, you know? Yeah, so Abuela was the woman that raised me. She was a black Puerto Rican woman who was unapologetically black and Boricua and refused to um, to even think about white standards of beauty. She lived her life in a way that was joyful and generous and raised us um, to love us. And one of the things that I wanted to come through in this book was how much she was for me like the woman who made sure that I survived, like because of her, I survived because she was a steady, calming presence, but also she, she, never, she never stopped pushing me and loving me. And I always, I always knew that I had her love. That was always clear. Even when I thought that there was no one else in the world that loved me, I always knew she did. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, she taught us to love our blackness and she, she raised us to, to understand that we were a black family and that no matter how the world saw us, um, that that's who we were. And she constantly, she referred to herself as Negra and called my brother, my sister and I, mi negrita y mi negrito. And to her, she wanted us to understand that those were terms of endearment. And um, in her house, everybody was un negro, una negra, and that we should love that word and we should love that you know, our own blackness. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to come through when I was writing the book was to show how much, even though I was experiencing all this other like trauma and violence, how much there was still joy in my life and how much um, while these terrible things were happening, I still felt joy and that's because of her. Absolutely. Jason, I feel like I know your grandma. <laughs> you talk about her so much. I feel like like all the world knows her, you know? Yeah, you know, she just was, I mean, I, I'm not going to, uh, I mean, I could talk about, talk about it too long, but, you know, she, 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 she is still like the greatest storyteller I know. And, and for different reasons, she didn't, she wasn't able to, um, write down and concretize those stories, right? Like those stories are passed on through us. And so, you know, in everything I write, everything I write, even if she's not there as a character, like she's always, she's always there. And, and what I, and, and, and what, what's so important to me about that is that like, I think it's easy to, to mythologize these women and um, the wonder for me comes in in, 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 in breaking the myth. Do you know what I'm saying? Like breaking, breaking the myth of, of the super black woman who can withstand everything. My grandmama cannot withstand everything. She took, she fucking is often in a lot of pain 
and she learned she learned how to navigate and laugh through pain and blah 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 blah. But she's also just like a funny ass human being, man. Like you know, like beyond all of the great stories and <laughs> all the Jesus talk, she wild. You know what I'm saying? She got the wildest stories in the world. She's the best liar ever. Um, but she also tells so many truths. So I just feel very lucky in that way. Yeah, I mean, I think I really agree with the, that's one of the wonderful things about memoir is that it really, it, I think it really pushes towards complexity in this way that there's so much temptation when you're working on fiction, you know, to create people as metaphors for, you know, kind of like specific symbols of, and specific qualities. Whereas when, you know, like when you know this person, you have a really strong obligation to portray them in all of their complexity. You know, the fact that my grandmother protected me from so much and yet at the same time, you know, like she couldn't get, you know, like throughout her lifetime, you know, couldn't really appreciate her own gifts and talents. Um, you know, like it's just like a really, really um, just striking um, element for me. I remember one of the things that she said was she refused to come to America um, for one thing. And then, um, and then the thing that she said was, you know, like, well, I don't know, I don't know what I can do in, you know, what I can do in America if I come and visit you, but maybe I can be your maid and clean your house. That was literally what she said, mm. because her imaginary couldn't encompass somebody like her being in America on equal footing with white people. Um, and that's heartbreaking for me. Um, and I don't know what to do with that, but as you can tell, I'm crying, so. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Meredith. I think that's one of the things that's hard about doing these, like, you know, this is where I would like lean over and like, <laughs> offer my hand, hand you a tissue, you know, a glass of water. And um, I know that people this are- This is what happens. This is what happens when I do a panel during my nap time. <laughs> <laughs> I get vulnerable. <laughs> I mean, it, it's also cancer season. So we're just, mm. you know, I don't know if everybody's been crying more, but I have. I'm um, a cancer, cancer, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, are y'all both cancers? <laughs> I'm a cancer, yes. I'm a cancer, so I cry every day. I try to make time for it in the shower. Wow. Cancer. I, want to be cancer. I wish I was a cancer, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but like your placements count because I'm I'm also a Leo and okay. uh, yeah, this is this is why you and me. We yeah. were destined to to like each other, but I like <laughs> but this this Venus and Cancer is my downfall. I'm just like, I'm, I just fall in love with everybody and, you know, like cry all the time now um, after years of being a hardhead. So I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about how do we create these spaces where there's space for that grief and those tears, you know, like that's just real. Well, that's what, you know what I mean? Like that's what love does, you know? And and I'm in my own house, so I'm going to talk how I talk. Like, that's what love do. You know, like, when Jahira talks about th this is, you know, when you, when you know that there's at least one person on earth who loves you, at least for me, it does so many things, but it just makes you not want to let that person down. And so, so many times in my life when, when I have let my granny down, like, those are the most heartbreaking times. And, like, the, 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 the times when I think I've been able to do something I never thought I could do, shit I know it wasn't me it was like I know that this person like like the only person in the world real talk that I know like at the end of the day like got me so mm -hmm. I I just sometimes you just feel I don't know I just feel like in real talk I always say this I feel so privileged because I know everybody does not have that everybody and everybody should have that in abundance but we don't and 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 having it is just like it's a fucking superpower, real talk, but it's unfair that everybody doesn't get to have it. Yeah. You know? For real. Shout out to my grandma who's going to be 101 years old, July 26th. So. Amazing. Yeah, she's in Cuba. She's like, national holiday on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But, you know, I want to talk a little bit about this genre. You know, I knew it was going to, I knew we were going to get on our feelings because this is, a, it's an emotional genre, right? Like to tell our stories. Um, and so just wanted to like ask each of you, like why, um, you know, as, as people who are all amazing storytellers and, and, you know, like creative folks, you know, like why put yourself out there like that? And specifically, like, what do you think memoir gives um, to, to being able to tell these, these racialized stories, right? These race stories that maybe the other genres don't do for you. I mean, I'll just say briefly, you, you know, even if you just listen to just the excerpts that, that we read, um, I, I mean, I think one could make this argument about every genre, but in memoir, particularly in the excerpts that we just read, I mean, to me, in some ways, the only genre that necessitates, you have to, like, you need to know how to write fiction, you have to know how to write poetry, you have to do some sort of reportage, you have to have an understanding of history. Like, I think there's a way to do memoir that necessitates, I'm not going to use that word mastery, but like a familiarity with all of these different genres. And real talk, if you go deeper, like they're all, they're, they're at once comedic, they're horrific, they're suspenseful, they're romantic. And, and so I don't know that I want to write another memoir, but I do know that to pull it off, you got to be able to do all that shit, you know? I agree. I agree. I think one of the reasons I specifically needed to write this story as a memoir and needed to claim it as nonfiction, um, one of the things I wanted to do was to to be able to say, these are real people. This is something real that I'm talking about. I'm talking about a larger world and a larger story, not just my personal narrative, but there, there are other things that I want to talk about. Um, like using my story, yes, to, to tell my personal story, but also to connect it with the larger world. And at the same time, um, finding the ways that I've been complicit in some of this, like mm -hmm. talking about memory and erasure and specifically the erasing of Black Puerto Ricans and calling out colorism and racism in our own families and in our own communities. And I wanted to show how I've been complicit and how easily it becomes to forget these things. Um, willingly and I didn't want I didn't want to write I would I want to fictionalize that I wanted to have a, a real conversation um, where there's something at stake where I can talk about myself as a real person and about the people that made me and that you know that made certain things about me like my language like where my language came from where I have found community um, and I also wanted to be able to write a story that centers the experience of being a kid from the projects, from un caserio. I have never, I never even imagined that I would find people from el caserio in a book. And recently a friend of mine who read the book said, they don't write books about people like us. Wow. Nobody writes about people like us. And I felt both, that was both to me heartbreaking, but also, um, profound because I thought I, this is why I'm a writer this is why I'm writing nonfiction because they don't write books about people like us so some of us have to yeah I mean I feel like if I were you know to write about some of these issues um in fiction in certain ways in certain ways a lot of people would find it implausible, right? Like the, the, the number of, um, you know, like the number of identities that collide um, in my personhood um, is something that's sort of like a little bit excessive and too much, right? So I feel like the impulse to write memoir, at least from a racial perspective, at least for me, arose out of this impulse to really, to just not, um, not, tr I feel like whenever I write fiction, there's a temptation to make things like clearer and cleaner and the lines, you know, like more defined, right? And I, and I love living in the challenge of living in the muck of memoir where you just can't, there are facts that you can't 
you know, like fiction in lies away. There are details, there are people, there are characters. Um, you know, so that's one thing. And then I also think that so often um, marginalized people are asked to justify ourselves and explain ourselves to a broader public. Um, and that's especially true um, for trans memoirs, very few of which are written by people of color. Um, none of which, as far as I know, um, have been written, you know, at least in America, um, by a Filipino person. And so, you know, and so that was also this really big factor, right? That, that I was not interested in writing a memoir in which I'm trying to justify my existence or my place in the world to other people. Um, I wanted a memoir in which I'm explaining, I'm, I'm narrating the story of myself to myself. Ooh. Thank you for that. I, to add to that, I, I, found, I find that the reaction, some of the reaction, reader's reactions to my book, specifically um, white men have been, this would be so much better if it was a novel. And, uh, and <laughs> my, my reaction is always, I didn't write it for you. Right. But also, um, I thought about writing this as a novel. I considered that I, for a long time, I was thinking of this as a novel. And then I had to stop because when I'm writing fiction, I'm, I'm thinking about plot and I'm thinking about creating a world that makes some sort of sense and and the focus is always on plot and I wanted to move away from that. I didn't want to write a book about resilience. I wanted to write a book that was resisting talking about survival or the performance of pain for white readers on the page, right? The performance of of pain. I wanted to talk about other things and I wanted us to focus on, I wanted readers to focus on um, the larger stories, not necessarily what was interesting in a plot, but a larger conversation about generational trauma and the erasure of Black Puerto Ricans and colonialism and navigating a certain kind of girlhood when you're Black and Brown and living in a marginalized community. Whew. I, I don't want to... Um... I mean, so all the thoughts are trying to come out at the same time. <laughs> um, what I wanted to, to just invite y'all is to like kind of pick our own adventure. Um, there's, you know, like the question of like, what made you want to be a writer is, is on the table. The question about like getting to talk a little bit more about the people, um, individuals, real human beings, characters who are in your books. But there's also some really great questions in the Q&A um, panel. And I also want to make sure that we have, you know, just some agency in choosing what, what direction we go in. So um, we've got about, I would say, 12 more minutes for questions um, before we get into the shout, out, shout outs and recommendations. And then depending on how long that takes, we can come back to more questions. So what do you all want to prioritize, just to be a little transparent here? I mean, I just have one thing to say about the desire to be a writer, which was that I did not grow up thinking that I could be a writer primarily because I did not read anybody in English who wasn't white growing mm. up, you know, like the, the, the entire Filipino Catholic school curriculum in English is populated by Hemingway and Steinbeck and Lewis Carroll. And I, you know, and so it just never, uh, it occurred to me that I can grow up to study English, even to teach English, but it did not occur to me until very, very late, <laughs> probably like around college, that it might be possible for me to be a writer. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I grew up in Mississippi, you know, like it, it's, it's 50th and everything, but you know, we ain't 50th in literature by far, but we weren't taught, we weren't taught, like we were taught white authors. And then when they taught Southern authors, I think they acted as if they were teaching black Southern authors, but Faulkner and, you know, we, we, Faulkner and Eudora weren't black, you know what I'm saying? So like, I remember as a kid just being real upset that 
I was being asked to imitate people who could not see me and that I got really good at it, which means I got good at writing myself out of my own experience. And the better I got at writing myself out of my own experience, the better grade I got. Um, and I just think that's damaging, fam. You know what I'm saying? As we're talking about all this shit that's going on in the country, we're, we're, we're also talking about lots, millions of people who have been incentivized to write themselves out of their own story to move up some sort of, you know, economic or hierarchical ladder. So I just knew the shit I was reading and the, and the stories I was hearing at home and the music I listened to should have more in common. And when I realized that they didn't, like I wanted to make an intervention. But I think what's interesting is like those interventions sometimes can still center whiteness and white folks in this ways that are wholly destructive. And I just think we have to be very careful about when we're centering whiteness and or when we're talking about white people pejoratively to bring ourselves pleasure. Because one of the things my family loved to do was talk shit about white folks when ain't no white folks around. So in my book, I'm doing some of that. Do you know what I mean? It just so happens, though, that my editor and my publishers and my publicists and all these, you know, all these white folks have some have their hands in it. But as much as I can, I have to try not to center them while acknowledging the pleasure that we felt by being honest and sometimes being dishonest about white people. That shit feels good. I love being in a room of non-white folks talking about white folks. Um, I hate being the only black person in the room talking to white people. I hate it. I hate watching that shit happen from, from a distance. And so, so for me, my memoir was an attempt at navigating all of that because there's so many white hands in it but I come from a culture that's not really interested in like catering to those people, but often finding pleasure at um, antagonizing them when they are not there. And I like antagonizing them when they are there too. You know what I mean? Like that, that's, that's, that's also is quite pleasurable to me. So. <laughs> um, you want to take this one, Jaquita, or you want to, move us into a different question um i i don't know how much time we have because i feel like <laughs> we've got about yeah yeah we got we got we've got time and we also have a lot of questions so um, i i guess i wanted us to maybe move toward one of the questions that that the attendees have asked but i don't know which one I'm really excited about this one about like, did you discover things when in writing your memoirs, did you discover things in yourself or your family that you didn't expect? Did it veer from your overall visions that you had for your project? And I think this is, you know, I'm still, I'm slowly trudging through heavy, right? Like I, I ate everything else up and heavy has, I have to take deep breaths to get through it, you know, but, um, but I think the main thing that, impacts me that I've been wanting to ask you for so long is about this this relationship with your mom and how it's like an ongoing thing you know T Tony Cade Bambara opens the salt eaters with this really great dis uh, disclaimer right where she's like just think it's a damn lie you know so that I don't get in trouble with the people that I'm talking about and you know I, I just I think think about the danger of memoir in those relationships. And so I'm curious about this, like, did you discover things about yourself? Did you discover things about your family that you didn't expect? How did it change your relationships? Um, you know, I think this question of, did it veer from your overall visions <laughs> is, is a pretty straightforward one, right? Like, yeah. I can't imagine that you, you wrote exactly what you thought you were doing, right? <laughs> no. No, I didn't write exactly what I set out to write. This book took about 12 years from, mm. from the first day I started writing it until I finished. And um, a lot of it was discovery, right? Writing and discovering things or at the same time, discovering things as I was writing them, specifically things about my relationships to other people in my life. Um, I talked a lot, I had a lot of conversations with my mother because I really wanted her to be okay with the fact that I was writing about her. And um, I wanted to be, to feel like I wasn't taking, like taking something away from her, taking some agency away because she's a woman who has lived most of her life suffering from mental illness and addiction. Um, and so it was important for me 
to do that with all the people in my family and all the people in my community so that I could feel like I was holding myself accountable, but also that I wasn't just writing about people, that I was writing about us and for us. Mm -hmm. And that this was a book very much written um, from, with, from inside my community. Um, what I learned about myself is that, uh, you know, like a lot of memoirists is that people remember things differently. My sister remembers things that happened in the book before she was born. And people will often um, recognize themselves even when you're not writing about them. <laughs> and they'll remember things differently. But my, for example, my, I'll give you one example. My sister remembers things about my fights with my brother the day that I got arrested and, and the day that I stabbed my brother. Some things that I don't remember and if I did, like if I was writing a novel, I would have included those things that she talked about in the book because that would have been a lot more interesting. But for me, that memory was so fractured and those moments were so fractured, which is why I needed to write about them the way that I did, um, that I couldn't, it wouldn't be a memoir if I wrote about that. What I discovered about myself is that I wasn't really interested in writing an interesting story, but I wanted to talk about other things. I spent a lot of time avoiding even focusing on what this book was about. I wrote like five chapters before I even mentioned my mother. I wrote around her and I wrote scenes that I, like she was in the room, but I didn't even put her on the page. I was avoiding writing about my mother and our relationship in large part because I didn't really want to face everything that my mother was in my life and how she broke me. Um, now our relationship, I think because of the book, because I was forced to be honest and face what our relationship, what our relationship actually was, um, we're closer. She calls me every day. We talk every day, but I have to be prepared to be honest about who she is and who she was. And I have to be prepared to forgive her every single time I talk to her, every single interaction, every single time we're in a room together, I have to be willing to forgive her every single time. Otherwise, I can't have a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I did learn that I'm much more forgiving. <laughs> uh, I don't think if I, if I hadn't written this book, I don't think I would have a relationship with my mother. That's real. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I had to write, uh, I'm just a draft, a draft, a drafty kind of writer. And so like, you know, the heavy that was most important for me was a heavy that nobody in the world saw except my mama. And then she told me what she thought and she told me what she thought had to come up out of there. And then, and then when I go back and revise that version, it was about like discoverable shit in language. Like, could you do shit with language you'd never seen? But so yeah, like I wrote, you know, Imani Perry the other day I talked to her, she was, she was talking about how like, you can't tell all the secrets if you want to get free. And I had never thought about it that clean, cleanly and clearly. Um, but that is true. And that's another way of also saying it's some of my truths that were shared truths. Just that I just did not trust the readerly public to share them. You know what I'm saying? To share somebody else, some of the stuff. I mean, because there's legal shit involved. You know what I mean? But, but I needed to write it all out. So anyway, I'm saying oftentimes when people are like, you know, when I'm writing this memoir, should I tell the truth? I want to change people's names. I'm like, you got to do whatever process feels right to you. But I feel like you jump in the gun. Like right now, it's supposed to be all discoverable. Like you should write the shit that you think you remember and talk to people and have that memory clash with like other mem memories. But then trust in like revision, you can maybe take some of that stuff out and, and be more ethical if, if, if the question is about ethics. So for me, the heavy that I wrote for me was, was, was very important. I discovered a lot about myself. I discovered that I was much more fucked up than I thought I was. And I thought I was fucked up when I started, but at the end of the day, that, that book saved my relationship with my mama. No question. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it took me probably like a couple of years to figure out the title fairest mm -hmm. um and before that i just had scenes and vignettes and notes 
Um, but then as soon as they figured out, you know, this sort of word that coalesced both race and gender, you know, so it was very clear to me that I wanted to, you know, to entwine them in the book and not, I, there was a lot of pressure on me from, in, from various places to make it a quote unquote trans memoir because trans is hot right now. Mm. So background everything else and make it about mm. trans. And, and I really struggled with that. Um, you know, but then as soon as I had that title, the book organized itself um, in a lot of ways. And, but the thing that I figured out most about myself was actually in revision because one of the things that I realized is that trans people are asked to tell our stories over and over again to please cis people and to make cis people believe us and, and feel like we're worthy of their time and energy and to fight for us, et cetera, et cetera. That I realized that the first drafts of a lot of my stories are actually taken from times when I've had to justify myself to cis people and it was only in you know sort of like heavy revision that I was able to sort of like unpack how I actually felt about those moments in my life apart from you know the gaze of cis people a really good example of this was you know like I wrote the scene you know the sort of classic trans scene about you know like being a feminine boy and, you know, like wanting to be a girl because I was obsessed with this child singer, Leia Salonga, um, who is, you know, like now famous in America as well. Um, and I wrote, you know, like what was kind of a prototypical scene about like me growing up wanting to be this girl. And then I realized, you know, like in revision that I was just like, no, I didn't actually want to be her. What I told myself at the time was that I wouldn't mind being a girl if I had her voice, right? And that's something that really kind of like shaped the rest of the book that, you know, like the being trans, the idea that, you know, like I need to be trans is in part, you know, a story that trans people tell because they know that, you know, when they tell that to cis people, cis people are just like, oh, you know, like, well, you needed to transition, so therefore I need to accept you. And otherwise, you know, like, otherwise you're too inconvenient. Right? Yeah, I, I want us to talk a little bit about this current political moment and pivot into, like, um, what y'all think are some of the you know, get into your shout outs. What are some of the salves? What are some of the, the kind of like books, movies, albums, um, et cetera, in this moment that, that you want to recommend to folks who are listening and watching um, and also what action you want them to take. Um, but really just to like take a minute to, to say like, this is the, I mean, you know, this moment is mind-blowing you know like i'm just like we nobody could have written this shit right like it wouldn't be realistic <laughs> right i was telling somebody like the editor would have been like nobody will believe this like right it would have never made it out the door but i don't you know like in our wildest imaginings um i mean you know i, I think octavia came close we've mentioned a few times but like but wow, right? Like this moment and the confluence of um, the isolation and, the, and, the, and the, the way that race is highlighted through this pandemic, right? That people are, communities of color are experiencing the disparity in such an intense way, right? And then also like in, in just like the, the, the meaning of like what it does it mean for your life to be expendable in your work in, in the medical history of things not being tested, you know, like to, to, like with you in mind, with your community in mind, all of those aspects of COVID and then like to have a resurgence of these uprisings to address like just the, the sick violence, right? That is woven into this 
country, like in destroying black people, you know, through the state um, and through this, all these forms of state violence, like that that's happening. And then in the middle of that, there's like this elevation of um, an accounting being called for all of us, including, you know, I speak as, as a trans identified person, as a gender non-conforming person, like for all of us to be like, what about black trans women, right? Like, and so I just feel like this moment, you know, and also cause I got to peek a little bit at what y'all were gonna recommend, but just like, I really want to elevate that and say like, wow, like, yes, absolutely nobody could have predicted this moment and that it's going in these directions um, which I'm so thankful for and also so filled with grief about the violence that it's taken for us to get here and the loss that it's taken for us to get here. So I just wanted to like contextualize that as y'all share your shout outs and your recommended actions. Um, I guess I can start <laughs> by sharing my shout out. Um, so one of my shout outs was Pose on FX, which you all should be watching if you if you haven't already. Um, one of the one of the things I mean, my partner is trans, and so being queer and trans in our home is like we're it's always around. We're always celebrating it and talking about it. And so for me, watching Pose in this moment, it's one of the only things that I have been able to concentrate on to watch and feel joy while at the same time experiencing rage because of the way that pose is um, focusing on a, on a very specific historical moment while also having moments of joy and celebration of beauty. And um, so it's one of the, one of the things I've been watching obsessively. Um, I would also, again, recommend, I guess I'll put it in the document, but I'll recommend, again, Daughters of Stone by Dalma Llanos Figueroa, which is a novel about the lives of five generations of Black Puerto Rican women. Um, and then, did you, did you want me to also talk about my recommended action? Yeah. Okay. So my recommended action is um, to support black trans men and black trans women and support the organizations that are actively supporting them on the ground, like providing actual resources like the Okra Project, the Black Trans Travel Fund, Black Trans Femmes and the Arts. And there are a lot of other organizations out there. So if I could recommend um, one action would be to go out and support those organizations. This is something that we can all do, you know, like from our homes in some way. Whether or not we have um, the funds, we can support them in other ways. Um, so I just wanted to put that on your radar. Um, I'll be quick. Uh, I, 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 think, I think what's interesting in this moment is like these sort of how-to books are the books that people are, 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 are most needing. And I completely understand that. Um, and I think like artful, different kinds of artful books are, are being neglected. And I, for, for, for some reason, I think poetry is being almost wholly neglected. Um, so what I really wanted to recommend is a book called Directed by Desire by June Jordan. Um, please, uh, yeah. Yo, yeah, if you don't have that book, please get that book. Um, June Jordan is a person who who would have predicted this, right? The question is, would, have been, would anybody have published her prediction is a different question. So June Jordan, directed by Desire. Um, and then, and, there, and there's two things. One, I just think, uh, you know, Derricka Purnell said this in The Guardian. She said this in interviews, it's just so crucial. You know, there are people out in our communities doing some of what we wish would be done. And I think one of the things we have to do is ask ourselves how we can be useful to those people, to those folks on the ground. And specifically, or from, I'm from Mississippi, lots of the rural hospitals that serve mostly Black and Latinx people um, and Indigenous folks are the hospitals now that are, are, are like falling apart, partially because Mississippi did not accept the expansion. Um, and so if there's any way that you and people you know who have some money can find ways to get money to these hospitals that now are being like fucking decimated because of the surge in Mississippi. Um, I think that would be, that would be great. And um, 
last thing person I'll say is there's this woman, Josie Duffy, who's a writer and a lawyer. And, and whenever I question my political instincts, I always go and try to read um, what Josie thinks about anything because she's just somebody I trust. So I also encourage y'all to, to if, you, if, you, if you don't trust your political instincts, like find people you do trust and ask them literally, like since we all stuck in the house, send emails to folks and just be like, yo, what do you think about, about this? But, but try not to burden folks of color. If, if any white folks out there, like, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm not talking white folks right now. I'm talking about us, but like, let's, let's just ask our own people, um, you know, who we trust, what we should be doing. Cause there are some folks out there who actually, I think have a better understanding. So thank you. Yeah, I mean, I have a similar impulse as KSA in terms of just thinking about the ways in which a lot of the books that people are reading are, you know, like are sort of focused on the factual elements of racism and anti-Blackness. And I think that for me, the books that have, you know, like really affected my life um, in that way have been, you know, like have been books that have reached into um, you know, like the deepest resources of like my humanity around these issues. Um, I wanted to talk about Real Life by Brandon Taylor, um, which is a book that deeply, deeply affected me in part because it's about, it's basically about um, a gay black um, graduate student, biochemistry graduate student in the Midwest um, and what it's and what it's like to be the only black um, student in his department. And I think the reason why it affected me, you know, like partially um, personally, you know, just because I, I have worked in science um, in the past, but also, but also it really sort of like underlined for me that, um, that you don't have to be, you know, the, the, the violence exists across all of these different dimensions, mm -hmm. even in, you know, like even at a dinner table, you know, like full of white people who are, who are seemingly behaving in civilized ways, right? Um, and that it doesn't have to be, you know, um, a sort of, a, you know, like overt and physical for it to have these lasting effects on people's spirits, right? Apart from the fact that Brandon is, you know, an absolutely amazing writer. Um, I've been binging, I binged the latest season of Insecure, which I highly recommend. Um, I'm watching, I'm watching The Good Fight right now, um, which is, you know, which is sort of a, a, a chaotic show, but one that I love. Um, and then in terms of, in terms of the actions, one of the things that um, I would really encourage people to do is to think about um, the, the people in their lives who, the types of people in their lives, in your lives that we surround ourselves, right? And that if there are, if there are types of people who we don't have close relationships to, um, you know, like we lived in a really fractured um, America. I have a ton of white friends who don't really have people of color friends. I have a ton of cis friends who, you know, I actually have had cisgender friends say to, to my face that they don't know any trans people because they've forgotten that I'm trans. Like that has happened to me. Um, and I, I do really think that it's really important for us to form, you know, kind of like strong, effective relationships with, you know, with um, different types of people, whether, you know, like certainly, um, you know, like certainly in terms of race, um, but also, you know, but also across class, across, you know, gender identity, across sexuality. Um, because those types of, um, you know, like those types of intimate influences are just as important as our political influences. Absolutely. Uh, we talk about that, you know, part of, I don't know if everybody knows what Race Forward does, but one of the things that I've been doing working here over the last 
seven years is um, doing a lot of trainings around racial justice. And when we talk about the fact that um, like the, the social segregation of this country and how, how prevalent that is, people are always surprised, but I'm like, but it's you. Like you, you are a human being who's living in this so socially segregated. Like I know that there can't be 80% in the world, but in this room, suddenly it's like 2%, like, you know, yeah. but like, I think that people, that thing that you're saying of like people forgetting, right. And being like, wait, what? Um, like that reality is just, there is, there's something about the truth and the way that this country is programming folks to think about and talk about race, even like, you know, I'll, I'll never try to speak for black folks, but I think for a lot of non-black people of color that I've talked to, the ways in which, especially in the immigrant experience, like the conditioning that happens to just buy into the racial mythology, right? Of the land of the free and the home of the brave is so intense. It's so intense, right? And so just thinking about like that social aspect, Meredith, like, Hmm. When I saw you writing it, I was like, yes. Hmm. <laughs> I was like, mm, yes. <laughs> like, I really like the way that you couched it too, you know, like in, in really being thoughtful and self-critical, right? And uh, I wanted to move into having folks talk um, to some of the questions either in the Q&A panel that we haven't answered yet, or there's some stuff coming up in the chat. But I also wanted to just take a moment um, to, to give a little bit of, you know, facilitators reflection, right, to y'all and, and the work that you're doing, right? Like you're actually, you know, Maya Angelou is the person who changed my life entirely, like, you know, saved my life. Like, I really think I would have died if I had not read, I know why the cage bird sings when I was 16. Um, and I, I think the fact that she was telling her story, right. Um, in her and her experiences and her voice, like she did a certain amount of work that is beyond the artistic, right. Like the, the world changing work that she did. And, you know, I wonder if she knew that, um, even in the first, you know, 10, 15 years of her having published that book. Hmm. And I wonder, like, you know, like, I just want to, there's a moment where I want to tell y'all, like, y'all are changing the world, you know, like, you're out here um, illuminating lives and, um, and telling stories that people are longing for. Um, and, and that reflection, like, it's powerful, right? Like, it's really powerful for there to no longer be that absence of truth, you know, um, that y'all have filled in a certain vacuum, right, for a lot of us. Like, there are things that I just, in all three of y'all's writing, you know, Meredith, like the, the, the piece that you did about dating, right? <laughs> um, when you talked about um, with your friends, like, and your friends, you know, that, that article was like a freaking game changer. And I think it was so illuminating, not just for me, like to be able to say like, yeah, this is a thing about the reality of dating while trans, but like, I think it's important for people who aren't trans to understand, you know, like, mm. and that's just one example, you know, I mean, how to slowly kill yourself. Like I just, I could go on and I'm not going to gush and make this a, a whole like, fan queer moment but I just wanted to, to <laughs> offer that and if you want to reflect on it cool and if not that's cool too we can look at these questions but I just want to say like it's it's more than just like pretty words right thank you that's that's all I can say and thank you for also um guiding this discussion with care and tenderness you know I think a lot of us have been doing these discussions and and um it's just a lot going on. And, and anyway, and, and, and I think it's just hard to be incisive and tender and um, and warm. Um, so thank you for that. It's love. 
Um, we got about 10 more minutes. Y'all excited about one of these questions in the Q&A panel? Or is there somebody in the chat you want to shout out, respond to? Um, um, I'm going to shout out Sarita Gonzalez, who always shows up. Yes. That's my girl. <laughs> I feel like she's she's never gets the recognition. So I just want to say, I we see you. <laughs> but he does I out see, here. I see a bunch of Filipinos in the room, and I am deeply mm -hmm. heartened. The one, the one, the one, of course that I that I notice a lot is Anthony Ocampo because. Oh. <laughs> um, and Anthony introduced uh, me and Kia Six. So. Um, so that's also, he's also special for that reason. Yeah, yeah Anthony was one, of, Anthony was in a, in a workshop that, I, that uh, we did in Oakland. And it was a lot going on in Vaughn at that time. But every day I went into there just like learning shit. And you know, sometimes when you teach and you just spend too much time learning and you're like, oh, fuck. I'm, I hope, like, I think they think I'm supposed to teach a little bit, but... <laughs> I was learning so <laughs> there, like deep intellectually, soulful, spiritually, and 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 Anthony was one of the primary teachers and still is one of my primary teachers. So big ups to Anthony for real. Yeah, and big ups to Vona, because that's a huge part of how racial justice reads even happened. Um, so you know, and and I wanna shout it out while also acknowledging like all institutions. It's got a lot of work to do. We got a lot of harm to heal from, you know, in its history and its founding, but just wanted to like really say like without, like Sarito was my mm. roommate, my, my sweet mate wow. at, at Vona, you know? That's my heart. And, and I see so many of my uh, rocket ship mates from the speculative fiction class on here. And, you know, Kiese, I still, every once in a while, I take out my copy of uh, how to slowly kill yourself that you signed and just I'm like, I'm gonna get there, you know? <laughs> like, so it seems so long ago, you know, yeah, I'm I won't get into that, but um It's been three years, yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad that I'm so glad that book can be of use. Uh yeah, I signed a terrible deal. Every time people tell me they're reading it, part of me gets mad because the dude, the white dude who who jacked me for me is getting paid, but you know, hey, it ain't about the money, you know, right? Look, but it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and also drag him, you know, like I'm like, like yeah. I'm like, dry your tears with your money, you know, yeah. like that's wrong. Um, that's such a powerful book. That letter, you know, like I I believe every masculine identified person in this country needs to read that, that echo, the letter, the echo, the letter. Yeah. I mean. That echo is the, that, I mean, it's in the center of that book and, you know, Kai, Darnell, um, Michael, uh, Marlon, I mean, that, that was a, that was a special, that was a special thing to be a part of that, that, that letter. So, for sure. Yeah, that's real. Well, we got a few more minutes um, and I just want to make sure that we don't miss out on our kind of like, a, you know, responsibilities of, of shouting out the folks who have made this possible. So I want to give a big thanks to our behind the scenes tech facilitator, Hiba Elias, who's um, keeping things running smooth and who's projecting this on our Facebook Live. I haven't even, because of the, when we lost you, Meredith, I, I was going to go, you know, post on Facebook so that my Facebook friends could be up in there. But um, Hibba's holding it down and I want to say thank you to her and the whole team, um, both the conferences and convenings team and the comms team over at Race Forward and shout out Color Lines. Like they are just doing some really powerful, powerful, powerful work right now. Um, they're having this really dope event tomorrow. They're going to have a live DJ um, for Pride and just I feel like it's such a great um gift of this moment where I finally feel like queer people of color is like not are not a novelty you know mm -hmm. and like just really thankful that, that that it's becoming you know just like the standard so um really excited and want to make sure folks can um check out color lines and 
get into this dance party tomorrow and, you know, just give y'all the opportunity, anybody you want to say thanks to, or, you know, um, any kind of like parting words before we close out as the thunder rolls here in New Orleans. <laughs> I just want to thank, thank, thank um, both, both of the writers that I'm lucky enough to be on this, uh, panel with for writing shit that like scared scared me as a writer you know I, I read both of these books um like a year maybe a year apart year and a half apart and I love that feeling when you write some shit and you just like my god like what the fuck am I supposed to do now you know what I mean like how how am I supposed to ever write again you know what I'm saying like that's a good feeling eventually but at first it's just like it's a wrap for you so thank y'all for writing that scary shit that like made me want to go back into the woodshed as as Mark Anthony Neal says. I appreciate y'all so much. I mean, can I say I literally read probably like three pages of your book while I was in the middle of writing Ferris and I put it down because it was just like, I'm going to want to rewrite my entire book if I keep reading this book. So I didn't actually pick it back up until I finished drafting my book. <laughs> I read Ferris. Um, I wanted to go back and re rewrite my shit, but it was already out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> what <I'm gonna> do? <laughs> um, and yeah, and so it's it's uh, an incredible, incredible pleasure, and you know, um, and just you know, just being in this space, you know, with other people of color. It's it's you know, especially as somebody who is often perceived as white. Um, it it it's a very rare and special place um, whenever I'm among my actual people. <laughs> and you get a book like Ordinary Girls that like, because, because of everything that's been talked about in this conversation, you're just like, wait a minute, like, how the fuck did she, you know what I mean? Because you haven't seen it before, you, 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 because you haven't seen it before, you're like, how did they do it? Like, how the fuck did they do that? Because you haven't seen it. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it speaks to the way the publishing industry, like, shapes our imagination, but it also speaks to the wherewithal that you kind of have to have to create a text like that. Absolutely. Thank you. I don't even know what to say. And I, I guess I'm going to find girl too, because um, when I finished, as soon as I finished the, the draft, of Ordinary Girls um, that I submitted to my editor um, about, I wanna say it was like three days after Heavy came out, I started reading it and I was having a similar feeling. I was like, right. what? What did I just read? It was so powerful. Um, every time I finished reading a section, I would go down in my building and go get on the treadmill because I felt like I needed to run because I had so much <laughs> so energized and I thought I wish that I could go back and write some of what, what was in Ordinary Girls um, because it felt like a conversation that you were having with someone definitely with your mom right but like it felt to me like I was getting to eavesdrop on this conversation that was so energetic um, that was honest and that was true but that was also kind of calling yourself out in a way that I haven't seen a lot of writers do, um, speaking honestly about yourself and your own shortcomings, um, which is something that, I, that I'm always thinking about when I'm writing nonfiction about not just truth telling for the sake of truth telling, but with a purpose, doing something with a purpose, with a purposeful mind, um, kind of having this conversation in our community, but always aware that other people are listening in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciated that. And also to talk about Ferris, which I just got, um, you all should go out and get, get Meredith's book. Um, go buy this book, especially right now. Like right now, yeah. go buy it. It's, I mean, we wrote, good, yes. we wrote good books, everybody. We just we need to work it. Up, right? like, and we sorry. and we're um, <laughs> partnering with um, black bookstores. So we just want to shout out Marcus Books in Oakland, but also, um, so all of the shout outs and everything is going to be in a document, a Google Doc that will be sent to all the participants um, with a video of this 
record the recording that we did we take you know it takes us about a week we transcribe it um and then we send it out to all of the folks who have registered um you get a link to the video and then we also um will send this resource garden and the resource garden has like links to all your websites like you know there's this really amazing resource that's like um a list of all the black bookstores i think I want to say in the U.S., but I think now they're going global, right? Like it's a Google Doc too, like somebody's um, putting it together and it's amazing. Um, but yeah, I want to shout out and be like, and for folks who are in the South, in New Orleans, especially community books got um, broken into, vandalized on Friday. So we want to make sure um, okay. folks not only um, are buying books from them, but also um, supporting their GoFundMe. So I'll stick that in the resource garden too. And just... Y'all are beautiful. I'm so thankful. It's bittersweet. This is our last one. We're starting to reimagine like what the next series of racial justice reads could look like. Um, but just this is like a chef's kiss, you know? So really, really thankful. And I don't know if y'all want to get all woo again with me and just like, let's, let's breathe it out together. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna take everybody, attendees, come with us. We're gonna take three big breaths together in and out. We're not gonna narrate or anything at your own pace. Just fill your lungs with all of this energy that we just got. It's just love. It's all. It's so much love. Thank you so much. Thank y'all. Thank you. Everybody. All right, y'all. Have a good day.